It's Not Just Routine is an activity of the Program for Infant-Toddler Caregivers developed collaboratively by the California Department of Education and West Ed. toddler care. Can I, can I put on him? Yeah. Can we wash your hands now? Are you ready? They yeah. offer time yeah. for a one-to-one -one contact Whoa. and attention to individual Whoa. needs. Whoa. Get your diaper all changed. Huh? Through routines, you and the child get to know each other better, and the bond between the two of you grows stronger. Routines are a major part of the curriculum. When they're done well, they help children feel good about themselves and learn important lessons. Routines are often seen as chores to be rushed through or performed on schedule. But to make the most of routines, caregivers need to give each child personal care that responds to individual rhythms and needs. We've asked some infant toddler caregivers to demonstrate the two sides of routines, making sure the basics are done properly and keeping the child's experience at center stage. Feeding infants is a complex routine involving health, nutrition, and much more. It begins with proper hand washing. Hand washing is the most important thing for preventing the spread of illness. Before and after handling food, especially raw meat or poultry, scrub your hands with soap and water for at least 10 seconds and rinse well under running water. Dry your hands, then use the paper towel to turn off the faucet. Afterwards, use lotion to keep your hands soft and free of cracks. It's just as important for children to wash their hands before and after eating. Toddlers like to do it themselves with plenty of soap and running water. Younger infants need more help to get their hands clean. A baby wipe or wet washcloth just won't do. The setting for feeding is important too. Babies need a peaceful place to be fed, away from loud noise and bright lights. The best way to feed them is on your lap, until they can sit up well on their own. Well, this works easier than the seat. Once they're able to climb into a chair on their own, they're ready to sit at a small table. The chair should fit so the child's feet are on the floor. This arrangement supports growing competence. Now let's take a look at what to feed infants as they grow. Early nutrition has a big impact on development. To begin with, mother's milk is the perfect baby food, economical and easy to prepare. Breastfeeding has so many advantages for infants. First and foremost, the bonding between the mother and the baby. It's the perfect nutrition for babies and it also carries antibodies that protect babies against illnesses. Breastfed babies have fewer colds and ear infections. For all these reasons, programs should do everything they can to encourage and support breastfeeding. If a mother can't come in during the day, the child can be given expressed milk in bottles. 
When giving bottles, elevate infants' heads while they drink. This lowers the risk of ear infections. Another serious issue related to bottle feeding is tooth decay. Baby bottle tooth decay is decay in the front teeth from having sugary substances on the teeth for an excessive amount of time. Often it's from a baby having a bottle of juice in their mouth for a long time. It can even be from having a bottle of milk in the mouth for a long time. Baby bottle tooth decay can create long-term dental problems, so never put babies to bed with bottles or let them walk around with them. When it comes time for solid foods, work closely with parents to introduce new foods one at a time. Here are some foods to completely avoid with children younger than 12 months. They can lead to allergies or illness. As children get older and are ready for a wider range of foods, it's important to serve small pieces. But stay away from popcorn, nuts, hot dog rounds, and grapes. These foods popular with preschool and school-age children can actually cause choking in infants and toddlers. Also, until children have plenty of teeth, avoid raw carrots. Keep up with family members about foods the child is eating at home. Of course, you'll want to respond to the children's preferences and offer choices from each of the five main food groups. Don't forget to ask families about allergies and make sure everyone knows about them. Because his stomach doesn't like it and it makes him a little bit sick. Three, four. It's sweet. Beyond the basics, mealtimes provide some of the most important lessons of the day. Here, baby Kyle's hunger is motivating him to use his communication skills. He learns his cry brings CC promptly, and most important, he learns to trust that his needs will be met. To Asha, a meal is much more than a routine. She's discovering things about herself and other people. Sarah is exploring the different textures of foods and developing motor skills like hand-eye coordination. Mealtime conversations are the perfect opportunity for language expansion. What does the horse say, Asha? <laughs> and group meals are a time for children to enjoy the give and take of social interaction. In a relaxing setting, toddlers learn many useful social skills. Very young children need food when they are hungry, not when it's convenient for the adults. Respecting their individual rhythms and schedules helps children feel good about themselves and makes feeding times enjoyable. <laughs> Diapering is an especially good opportunity for closeness. Think of it as something you do with the child rather than to the child. Begin with a pleasant, well-ventilated setting furnished with the right equipment. Posted diapering procedures, a sink away from food areas, plastic-lined wastebasket with foot-operated lid, sturdy surface with barrier three inches above the pad, Supplies located nearby, but out of reach of children. Make it easier on yourself and more fun for the children with portable steps and have the diaper table at a comfortable level. 
Save your back by remembering to bend your knees when you pick up an infant. Have everything ready so you can concentrate on the child and never leave a child unattended. Although some programs require gloves, most experts agree that they are not necessary for routine diapering. Gloves should be used when a child has a bloody nose or injury, an oozing rash or blood in the diaper, and when the caregiver has an open cut. When caregivers use latex or vinyl gloves, it's very important to know when to use them and also how to use them. Because if gloves are used incorrectly, you can actually risk spreading more germs than if you didn't use them at all. So the proper way to use gloves is like this. Put them on. And imagine that I've just cared for a child's bloody nose and the outside of the gloves is contaminated with blood and potentially germs. When I take the gloves off, I have to be very careful not to contaminate myself. So when I take off the first glove, I grab it in the center here. I don't grab down at my wrist because the outside of this glove that is contaminated will then contaminate my wrist. So I grab at the center part of the glove and pull it up. Then ball the glove up in my hand and now this hand is clean. To remove the dirty glove I can't grab at the wrist again or I'll contaminate my clean hand. There's only one place I can go and that's underneath to the clean part of the glove and then flip it inside out and dispose of it. Oh. If caregivers oh use gloves for diapering, they need to be taken off with the correct procedure and at the correct time of diapering. They need to be taken off at the end of the dirty part of the diapering procedure and disposed with the dirty diaper and the dirty diaper wipes. And then the caregiver with her clean hands will put on the clean okay. diaper for the child, Brand new one. pull up the clean clothes, carry the child to wash her hands and take the child back. After the child's back at play, wash and then disinfect the entire diaper area, plastic covered changing pad and surrounding surfaces with a bleach solution. Use enough spray to get the area glistening wet. Spread it around with a paper towel and then let it air dry for two minutes. Finally, wash your own hands thoroughly. With these and all health precautions, consistency is important. Often we think that we can tell if somebody's carrying germs. We can tell if they look sick that day and, well, when that child's looking sick, I have to be careful to wash my hands after I feed the child. But we don't know who's carrying germs. Often we all carry germs without any symptoms at all. And so health authorities have recommended a term that we call universal precautions, which means that we need to take the same precautions all the time with everybody, whether they look sick or not. Diaper. Yep, those are diapers. Of course, the baby is more than just a bottom to be cleaned and changed. Loving care that includes the child fosters all kinds of learning. Talking to the child about what's happening helps connect her experience with words. Brand new one. Alex needs a diaper change, but that's not all he wants. He's looking for contact with Jean. He gets that, plus a chance to explore rhythm and movement. Casey lets Margot know what to expect and encourages her involvement. This helps Margot to feel good about herself and builds a foundation for toilet learning later on. During Michael's diapering, Lynn takes time for conversation. And then you want to go back outside? Mm -hmm. Her attentiveness supports his success with language. 
Even though it may seem like just a necessary chore, a leisurely, sensitive diaper change is a perfect time for deepening the relationship between you and the child. Transitions between waking and sleeping are vulnerable times for young children. A special caregiver who understands the child's unique needs makes all the difference. It isn't always easy getting to sleep in the excitement of group care. So to help children nap, you need a peaceful environment. Aren't you gonna rest today? Have low light, good ventilation, and a comfortable room temperature around 70 degrees. In Pat's family child care program, small foam couches open up into beds. They're covered with washable, waterproof material. For a young infant, a good quality crib is the best place to sleep. Remove any pillows or toys, especially stringed toys that could strangle an infant. Make sure the side rails are securely locked and high enough so an infant can't fall out. Crib slats are no more than two and three-eighths of an inch apart, so an infant's head can't get stuck. Corner posts shouldn't extend more than one-sixteenth of an inch. This post is flush on one side, so an infant's clothing can't get caught. Do the two fingers test to be sure that the mattress fits firmly with no gap. And finally, check for rough edges or exposed bolts. Oh, you need a tissue too? Another risk for infants around nap time is the spread of infection. Launder bedding and wipe down sleeping surfaces with a bleach solution at least once a week or right away if bedding is soiled. Leave plenty of space between the beds for fresh air to circulate. Keep bedding separate by labeling it and storing it with the child's cot in individual bags or in cubbies. A major health concern is SIDS or Sudden Infant Death Syndrome also known as crib death. Although this is a rare cause of death in infants, it does occur usually between the ages of three weeks and five months of age, and it can occur in child care. Unfortunately, there's a lot that we still don't know about the causes of SIDS and what we can do to prevent it, but we have found through research that there are some things we can do to reduce the incidence of SIDS and caregivers need to be aware of these things. One of the most important things caregivers can do is place infants in cribs on their backs until they're older and can easily roll over on their own or unless otherwise advised by the child's doctor. Here are other recommendations for safe sleeping. Don't smoke cigarettes in areas where infants are cared for. Avoid soft materials, such as pillows, down comforters, or beanbag chairs that could interfere with a small baby's breathing. Don't let infants get overheated. Sleeping room temperatures for babies should be the same as those that make you comfortable. Encourage breastfeeding or feeding infants expressed milk. Keep up on immunizations. Always be nearby to supervise sleeping children. Finally, keep up to date on the latest SIDS prevention information and make this information available to parents. For all infants, nap routines need to be tailored to each child's style and individual schedule. This includes being as consistent as possible with home. While younger infants may nap at any time during the day, older infants often have a group schedule for naps, but they should always be able to take a nap when they're tired. Daddy. You ready tonight, night? Okay. If a child doesn't nap when other children do, provide choices in a separate area. Pat puts children down relaxed, but still awake. This way they can learn to comfort themselves with a familiar blanket, fingers, or a thumb, and then drift off on their own.
helping children to sleep and easing them into wakefulness is time well spent. These tender times can build the child's trust in you. Giggle time and wiggle time. Songs and stories, especially those that have a connection to the child's home, not only help children relax, but also play an important role in language development. Chris wakes up early, but that's okay. Casey is there for him to adapt the routine to his needs and inclinations. In just this brief interaction, she supports his self-esteem, encourages his participation, and strengthens the relationship they share. When you make the connection between the basics of routines and the child's overall experience, you can really see the difference. The basics become a prelude to so much more. A sharing of warm and lively times and rich opportunities for learning.